clients have a huge role to play in influencing health and safety and well-being within the industry. Um, they set the bar. Um, I feel that clients have an essential role to play in setting that bar. Um, legislative compliance is nowhere near, near enough in large infrastructure projects in particular, but more widespread in construction and, and clients have to take the responsibility to set those standards in the, in the very first instance. Um, it, it sets the stall out at the earliest opportunity and it gives the supply chain an opportunity to understand what the expectations are, to be able to price accordingly, but also to then meet those expectations during the delivery of a project. The impact that clients have on setting expectations is, is varied and mixed, if I'm honest. Um, I think raising the bar is essential, um, but where we are falling short is the lack of consistency. And that lack of consistency is creating inefficiencies within the supply chain. If you think of one of the tier ones or any of their supply chain for that matter, they could be working on several different projects. As they move from project A to project B to project C, the expectations of clients change. To all intents and purposes, the bar is probably at the same level, but there are subtle differences that are requiring the supply chain to adapt. Now, that adaptation is not always a bad thing, but it can be very inefficient. We have to work harder as clients to come together, to collaborate more, to, to try and agree on an industry standard um, that allows those efficiencies to be met within the supply chain. At, at Tideway, we've set our own bar we're now already looking to how we can share that with other projects. It's important that those projects take that on board and don't just continue to add another layer. Arguably, we've done it here at Tideway. Um, I was at Crossrail before I was at, at Tideway and, and we learned from the Olympics, but we added another layer on top. So it was the Olympics plus one. Tideway is arguably the Olympics plus Crossrail plus one. I think we've just got to be very careful that we don't just keep adding layer after layer after layer um, without any real value. Sometimes less is more, and I think if it's worked and it's worked in the past, we as clients need to embrace that and say, yes, that's exactly how we want it to work and take that one forward as an industry, not just by project. Clients setting standards is, is an important element. Um, but standards alone don't make for strong health and safety performance. And in fact, sometimes they can actually have a negative impact. So we have to be very careful in the standards that we set and pick and choose where standardization is the right thing forward. We should not take away the ability for clients and their supply chain to, uh, to be creative, to be innovative in their ways of managing health and safety risk and also promotion of uh, positive well-being within the workplace. So we have to set our stall out quite early, but not make it overly bureaucratic, um, that it becomes a burden on the supply chain to, to meet those expectations. And I think we are, we are seeing the rewards of, of, of where that bar is being set. I've um, had the pleasure of working on some, some sites that are the best that I've seen in my career but we've still got a long way to go. And if we can start to have more consistency with or without standards, but consistency, then we will start to, to see the transition from one project to the next being far smoother than it is currently. Um, and I, I think that's where the real benefit lies. So, so some examples where it's not working particularly well. Um, are, for example, behavioural safety programmes. Um, each organisation within the industry generally has their own corporate programme that they're following. You then have a client that comes in and specifies something that will be along the same lines but slightly different, probably badged differently. That in itself has challenges because you have an individual that's used to working under one particular brand coming onto your programme 
and then trying to adapt to the needs of that, albeit that the behavioural programme itself might be very, very similar. But behavioural safety programmes are a bit like uh, health and safety passports and, and CSCS cards. They kind of just grow uh, with, with, with time. And, and we haven't, again, embraced that to, to have a consistent approach. So that, that's certainly one area where I think we've got a lot of work to do. The, the challenges of the behavioural safety programmes um, and whether they're working or not, uh, I personally believe it's not necessarily that they're not working per se. It's the, um, the ineffectiveness of a behavioural programme decades after these things were first brought to the market, if you like, with DuPont and their STOP programme. We just haven't evolved these behavioural programmes to the degree that I feel we should have. Um, within the industry. In fact, I think we've, we've taken a wrong turn somewhere along the, the road. Um, and if you think back to Heinrich and Bird and, and their traditional accident triangles, we focus on the base of that triangle with the unsafe acts and conditions. And naturally, we've fallen into this area of focusing more on the unsafe acts. If you actually look at Heinrich's research, he wasn't talking purely about unsafe behaviours, but we just ignored many of the other areas. James Reason probably has it much better with his Swiss cheese model in the fact that behaviour is one layer in, in that area, but we've, we've started to use phrases like 98% of accidents are caused by unsafe acts um, and behaviours. So we naturally focus on the behaviours, and, and whether we do it consciously or, or subconsciously, we're actually developing a blame culture. So if, if an individual's involved in, in an accident or an incident or a near miss, um, the investigation will generally throw up some form of behavioral improvements. And that individual will, will, will have some blame apportioned to them. Um, and I don't think we, we've quite got it right within behavioral programs. And, an individual working on a site in construction does not need to know, in my opinion, an antecedent of behaviour and a consequence and the science behind what drives behaviour and, and, and we shouldn't be trying to change behaviour. I think we should be influencing behaviour rather than looking for behavioural change. You influence behaviour by creating an environment where individuals change their own behaviour. So you create the right working conditions, you give the very best facilities for individuals that are working within your sector in, in hours in construction. Um, and then individuals just naturally move in the way that you want them to move. If you like, it's a, it's a kind of a nudge. Um, rather than somebody coming out with a clipboard and measuring safe and at-risk behaviours and then giving you a percentage at the end of the month or um, going through the science. There is a place for that. I, th I think it's important that managers understand what, what's at the heart of behaviour and what, um, what influences behaviour and, and why people behave in a particular way. But I think we would get a much bigger bang for our buck if leaders within our business actually understood more about their teams and understood what makes those individuals tick rather than understanding the science behind behaviour. Once you understand how the behaviours tick with the right environment, the best facilities, you can then get the very best out of your teams. Changing behavioural programmes and, uh, and standardising behavioural programmes um, is not necessarily the way to go. Again, you still need some form of flexibility you still need autonomy and you still need creativity within, um, within those programmes on any programme. Um, where I think the focus should be on standardisation is standardising the, the environments and the facilities that are created on construction sites. A good example that we've done at Tideway, we've raised the bar on welfare facilities. On many construction sites, you used to have a situation where 
those working on the construction site went through the turnstiles and those working in the office went through the nice clean office environment. We've changed that and everybody goes through the same area, everybody has access to the same high quality facilities. So the very, very simplest of things is astonishing when you, when you ask for feedback. It's the simplest of things that individuals want. They want access to changing areas that are large enough to accommodate the numbers of people that are on site. They want lockers that have a clean and a dirty area so that they're, they're not cross-contaminating their own personal um, possessions. They want washing facilities. They want showers. They want showers that actually work with hot water. They want enough um, showers for everyone that is liable to use them. They want good quality canteen facilities, an area where they can have some quiet time. All simple stuff that, that we sitting in offices would generally take for granted, but on construction sites that's never been the case. So I think from a standardisation perspective we should be really raising the bar on saying this is where we have to provide the very, very best for those that, are, let's be honest, are exposed to the higher risk day in, day out. And if we can give them the very best facilities, then their behaviour is likely to be influenced by that. They'll be far more focused on addressing and managing the risk than they will thinking about the poor conditions they're expected to work in. Should health and safety practitioners consider a behavioural programme? Um, yes and no. I know that sounds very much like sitting on the fence, um, but one really needs to understand what is the expectation, what is the goal, what are, what are you trying to achieve in, in implementing a behavioural programme. If you're just doing it because it's a tick in the box and, and everyone has one, so we need to have one, um, I, I, I feel that that's wasted effort. I think what you should be doing is you should be engaging with your workforce at every level and understanding what it is that the real issues are. And then if that, fe if that then feels that a behavioural programme is the white, right way to go, then by all means, take, take that direction. Speak with others, find out what their challenges have been in implementing it, get the right programme for you. But if it's not what your feedback is telling you you need, then don't bother. It's just another thing that you're adding to the list of things, adding to the layer after layer after layer of things that we expect our teams on site to be involved in and be engaged in. And if, if they're telling you that it's not going to have any value, then don't put it in place.